And now, as we near the end of the Reykjavik Global Forum, Women Leaders, we present an important discussion on where we need to go next. We know that women leaders are underrepresented in leadership positions across sectors. Numbers of women leaders must increase, societal norms must change. Ahead of next spring's Generation Equality Forum, this panel will feature a group of UN Women's Leaders for Generation Equality to discuss the importance of diverse and intergenerational leadership. Please welcome conversationists Angelique Kijo, Amy Weaver, Lopa Banjeri, and Annika Jane Dorothy. Hello everyone, I am Anika, your chair for this session. A very warm welcome to the panelists that I have with me, Lopa, Amy and Angelique. Come, dialing in from Nairobi, I am pleased to be part of this auspicious panel to bring to you the Women of Generation Equality Leadership. Getting right into it, Generation Equality has provided a platform for us to renew the spirit of the 1995 Declaration and Platform for Action. Taking this further, I'm going to turn over to Lopa to, to start off the conversation by asking Lopa, in the year 1995, our mothers came to us with a new dawn and a new message that women had been liberated. In the launch of Generation Equality, with leaders being the defining factor in framing the narrative globally, what message are we as women leaders in generation equality sending to young women and women all over the world and girls about generation equality? What is its defining moment and what is its pivotal movement moving forward? Lopa. Thank you, Annika. Uh, the main message for generation equality is that equality in this generation now. It's a message of urgency, of radical change, led by young people at the heart of it, but focusing on intergenerational and intersectional leadership. Why? Because 25 years after Beijing, and the adoption of the Beijing Declaration and Platform for Action, we have seen change. We have seen progress. Mainly, the progress has been in laws and policies all over the world. But change has been slow, sluggish, and has done little to change the systems of the world that hold inequality in place. And so today, 25 years after Beijing, women in leadership positions across the world are only a quarter of the decision-making tables. And what we have seen as a result of COVID is that uh, whatever inequality existed has been exacerbated and the conditions of systemic inequality have been illuminated. So at this point in time and going forward, the message of generation equality is that we are bringing together a multi-stakeholder uh, leadership cohort of women and men across the world, across sectors, joined together to accelerate the implementation of commitments made for gender equality, through these 25 years and to focus on the energy and activism of young people together with the experience, resilience and leadership of older generations of activists so that we have this intergenerational multi-stakeholder collaboration for movement building for gender equality with an urgent rapid implementation agenda uh, and impatience to achieve change and equality now. 
Great. Um, I think we, we are all very anxious to see the unfolding of generation equality because basically uh, young women like me are looking for a new home for the new young feminist movement that has begun really with, uh, uh, with the, the, the Me Too movement. And that leads me to my next question to Amy. You know, Amy, the private sector has really uh, received a lot of flack from society for, uh, and, and governments and, and, public, and the public generally for disregarding or not creating a safe space for women, uh, noting that we have had progress, but also noting that there's a new wave of young feminists who speak up for themselves in the workplace, but are also taxed at the same time. What would you say to them and what would you uh, tell other women leaders in the private sector on how to protect and create a new path of understanding gender equality in the workplace and private sector. So delighted to be here. And my biggest advice to the generation equality comes down to one word, and it's the word that Lolo used, and it's impatience. We need impatience. Uh, we've made incredible progress over the last 25 years. I graduated from law school in 1995. So when I look back at what happened uh, 25 years ago, it perfectly matches up with my career. Now, there have been some real movements forward in the corporate setting. Uh, the three I would po point to, uh, the mater maternity leave and laws affecting that have uh, improved dramatically. Pay equity. There is much more attention to it. This never should have been an issue, but we are making progress. And simply the number of women in the workplace has increased dramatically. Now, what I don't think has increased is our view of leadership and what we're telling young women as they enter the workplace. So the three things I mentioned are three things that are easy to measure. Perceptions of leadership, that's not as easy. And I'd really like to call out Michelle Harrison and at Cantor and her work with the Reykjavik Index. If you look at that and you look at what perceptions are of leadership, they're still very much following this older model. That's where we need to make the changes. And what we need is for women to come into the workplace with all of the excitement, with all of the goals, with all of the ambition, trusting in their own skills, trusting in their talents, and not being too quick to change their style, their goals to match people who came before them. I think we need the impatience and we need the confidence in our own skills to move forward. Right. Uh, thank you very much, Amy. And I just like to, you know, circle back and take this conversation back to day to day living. And, and I'm throwing this to Angelique, looking at as an African, um, the year 1995 really spelled a sense of freedom for African women. I mean, let's face it, some of our mothers couldn't even speak at a public gathering, but the 1995 declaration meant that equality was here now at the time. In your experience with the Batonga Foundation working on the ground, does how does generation equality create a new dawn for African uh, women leaders at the grassroots level, what does this mean to them and how can they take it forward? I've always seen my responsibility as a leader to lead with action and not just words. Words are important, they lift up narratives, they beneath, be, benefit us as women, as African women, but we also always fell short to seeing action come out of them. Because in action, you have to face sharing power, privilege, access. With word, you don't have to give much away. I also think that we have the responsibility and should be held accountable to bridging our leadership's level with those who are living with very issues we are here talking about. Because there is women leadership in Africa, in, Af in the African villages, as much as there is in these virtual halls of power. We are at a turning point. With COVID-19 and many other crises on the continent, the pandemic of domestic violence, early marriage and pregnancy and poverty, women and girls are at huge risk of seeing those inequality quadruple. We are not just dealing with the issue we know about. 
but we also dealing with the consequences of amplifiers like isolation, loss of income, etc. I think we need to be very, very clear about this. If we don't lift women and girls up now, there will be much more work and the effort will be much harder later. So as a leader, when I understood the opportunity behind the Generation Equality Forum, I decided to put my energy and Batonga's energy in mobilizing those very women whose future are at stake. First, by informing them about the forum, most of them I talked to didn't know anything about it and what it can mean for them. Two, organizing them around clear priority that they come up with, and then using my power and access to make sure those voices are heard. And that the commitment we get at the forum match what they need. In just a few weeks, more than 700 women and youth leaders registered to be part of this because they want to be active participants in building the world into a model that works for them. And we believe in inclusion and intergenerational collaboration. And we have a new platform, a new uh, um, program called Nos Voix Compte, which means in English, our voices count. The team of that have young leader, youth leader from Benin, our coordinator is from Senegal. We are leading by example and truly investing in horizontal, horizontal leadership and collective leadership. That's where I think we can make a huge difference. Right. That's, that's really amazing. And we are really proud of the work that you're doing at the grassroots level. Uh, circling back to how this really affects our day-to-day -day lives, noting that each and every woman's journey is different and difficult and one of great resilience in this generation equality space, the feminist space, um, bringing it back to Lopa as a woman leader and chatting your way to this level of being the um, coordinator and convener of generation equality from you and women. How does a woman in a feminist space rise up to this level? What was the defining moment in your career that made you know that this is what you want to do? And how, what would you tell women leaders wanting to get their voice out there heard, you know, to contribute to this space, Lupa? You know, I've always said that uh, 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 a woman, no matter where she sits, high, low, in the middle, uh, uh, every single woman in the world, in positions of leadership or not, has faced discrimination. There is no single woman in the world who has not faced discrimination at some point in time in her life. Some more, some less, but they always have. And therefore, uh, my own personal uh, experiences of, of, of discrimination or exclusion defined uh, the, uh, me, uh, defined my journey and, and that I wanted to do um, some to, to ensure that I had a level playing field for my own aspirations but at the same time realizing the second point of, uh, of my motto, if you will, is that uh, there is nothing that happens without solidarity and mm. shared sisterhood. It, right. uh, so I have stood on the shoulders of women who have gone before me and my right. shoulders are available for women who come after me because okay. it is about shared solidarity with women and girls all over the world, but also with male allies, because gender equality is an all of society aspiration. It enables equality for every member of society. And therefore that shared solidarity with male allies, but fundamentally sisterhood being there for each other and mm. seeking space when another voice is important to be heard. Great, that's so amazing. Uh, uh, great lessons there on shared solidarity and sisterhood. And Amy, you know that um, women in STEM, young girls coming up, 
understand that yes, this is a space that we are told we can conquer, we can set our foot in. We are they're really looking towards uh, the, the women who've been there before, but really sometimes flail and don't know, you know, how to reach out or where to start. And you are a real trailblazer in 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 technology. So um if I may ask, how how has been the journey or, you know, and also looking at the girls coming up across the world, what are we doing for girls in STEM to have them really contribute to, you know, the economy in this space? So the STEM field is really exciting, especially over the, about the last five years in terms of getting girls involved, excited and connecting. And there's been a real difference in really just seeing girls think, that's me, seeing people who are doing it, seeing programs that are really designed for them and made fun. And I think people tend to forget that all of the earliest computer programmers were overwhelmingly women. Mm. But over time, that started being viewed as something that you catered to boys, the little play computers were put, made blue and put on the boys aisles of the toy store. That was a deliberate shift in some ways. And we're needing to pull that back and show that STEM is something that is available to everyone, to boys and to girls. Now, I want to make, I always get a little bit nervous when we start talking about STEM and really talking just about how we are bringing up a new generation of girls. That is wonderful, but that is going to take way too long. We need to make sure these doors are open to technology and to cutting edge jobs for women who are in their 20s, their 30s, their 40s, their 50s, their 60s, mm. and not let these generations go by. So we've got to invest just as much in those areas. At Salesforce, we're very involved in public education, but we're also very much involved in education that allows people to go online free and change their careers, which I think is really, really critical. But I did want to pause also, and something just struck me so much from both what Angelique and Lola said, and it is about having women's voices heard and the solidarity. And I think if there's one thing I see in the corporate sector that holds women back the most from go, continuing to go up, it's not being heard and not being seen. And some of that is due to voices, some of that is doing, being talked over, but we can fix this. And a, one of the best ways is through this solidarity. And I try to challenge myself every single day and I would ask each of you to challenge yourselves. By the time you leave work or the time you go to bed, what have you done that day to make another woman seen, make another woman heard. It can be something as small as repeating what they just said in a meeting. It can be something as small as retweeting something someone may have done to get more attention to it. But I really urge everyone in, in this wonderful sisterhood that Lola described, challenge yourself every single day to help make a woman seen and a woman heard. Thank you. Thank you really mu very much, Amy. Um, I think what's really important in all, in the whole space of generation equality is that we are, we are giving platforms and spaces, safe spaces mm -hmm. for young people, for girls, for, for young women, for women who are mid in their mid careers and, and, and want to relaunch themselves to society. I'm going to wrap this up by bringing in Angelique to just bring us into the thrusting of a woman on the national stage, on a global stage. It presents a new dawn for all of us who are really invested our lives in generation equality, in the feminist space. Please tell us, as a woman who has fought stereotypes, especially in the music industry and, and you know, in, in breaking new barriers, what does the future look like for this generation? I think the generation that is coming uh after us um, are really savvy and um, very demanding and they know they, 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 they value. And it's, it's, a different, it's a different frame than, than where we came from. For me, the question that I ask myself is, how do we, we women, we see leadership, women leadership, what does it mean? We have mm -hmm. to really define that and be, be clear about what it means to be able to empower other young girls and young women to be leaders. We have to define that. And in that leadership, women leadership, there can be discrimination. We can discriminate from where the people come from. It cannot become an elite club. It has to be a place where every single 
person, every single woman feel entitled to be seen and heard. LGBTQ have to be part of this. There's no feminism when we leave some sister behind. There's no feminism, there's no women leadership without men being part of this discussion as Lopa and Amy said. That's what we have to do. We have to be bold, we have to be courageous and stop talking and fight every stereotype every time we face it. Right. Thank you so much, Angelique, and thank you to this amazing panel. You have been great in bringing forth your personal convictions, your stories, and your lessons, and you know, shared values on sisterhood and solidarity. You know, as young people coming onto the stage, we are often wary because, as, as Angelique has said, we are more active, we are more ambitious and more aggressive, wanting things now, nothing for us without us, and, and you know, all that. And we are very insistent on leaving no one behind in the LGBTQ space, you know, in, in the in, in the girl space, in the young women space. And this has a really been a chance for us. We look at generation equality as a new dawn for young feminists. And we hope that there's space for everyone. And we're really looking forward to the action coalitions that launch a new dawn in generation equality in the feminist space, and also creating a safe space, as all of you have said. This cannot be done in isolation with one gender alone, bringing together men and boys. And I like what Amy has said, that we do not have to wait for the younger generation of girls and boys to come up in generation equality. Let us reinvent the wheel for everybody now who's 20, 30, and 40 for us to understand really the tenets of gender equality. As young people, we cannot wait to jump on this bandwagon. We cannot wait to have a platform and a space to relaunch the 1995 Beijing Declaration and tell the world we are here now. And so I am going to sign off and uh, wish all of you a great evening. Thank you for joining this esteemed forum with the women leaders of Generation Equality. Thank you.